And hi, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Beyond the Cage podcast presented by Fight Chicks. I am your host, Jim Graham. Alongside me is my co-host, The Juice, Dave Sadler. We are going live here on Beyond the Cage a little bit later than usual. Of course, it's uh, about 1230 here in the east, 1130 central, where Dave's at in Chicago. And once again, I apologize. My power went out yesterday afternoon. It did not return after about 24 hours and by that time, Dave was already at work, so we had to delay today's Beyond the Cage. But if you aren't with us late, of course, it'll be up first thing uh, Thursday morning, audio and video version. So no worries there. We're still doing the show this week. And on this week's show, of course, we got some headlines for you. We got two fight nights to break down, UFC Fight Night 48 and 49. And we are also going to pick the main card fights for UFC 177 this weekend on pay-per-view. As I said, I'm Jim Graham, and he's the juice, Dave Sadler. How's it going, Dave? Look at this. Wendy's, 99 cents. Um, everything's great. Hey, for those of you, uh, you said it was 12.30 in the East, 11.30 in the Central. It is 6.30 in Hawaii. So don't they do this in Hawaii, Jim? I that. believe so. That's the hang loose uh, sign. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Finally had some fights. Um, got some fights coming up. Got uh, got a lot going on. So um, Vegas UFC 178. Not not we don't want to get we don't want to look past 177, Jim. But I have tickets to 178. That's coming up. Um, next week's show, I'm gonna give everybody. I'm just gonna let everybody know. Not this coming Wednesday. But the following Wednesday, that show is going to be awful, so you might not want to tune in. I'm uh, I'm headed to the Garth Brooks concert, and I probably won't have a voice. So it'll be Jim going, hey, thanks for listening to Beyond the Cage. And it'll be me going, that'll, that'll be what you'll hear. You'll have to uh, tweet so in all your in. responses. <laughs> our, first show, uh, our first show ever just on Twitter. It'll just be... A... <laughs> 140 characters at a time. And it'll, ju <laughs> it'll just be me put posting smiley emoticons. Well, we are delayed a little bit, Dave, as we mentioned, but we aren't as delayed as the UFC Tops card set 2014 champions, which uh, has been delayed. It was supposed to come out, I, I think it was supposed to come out today, wasn't it? And it's been delayed, I believe, two weeks. Yeah, um... The tenth is now the current date, so um, yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, you know, we're we're gonna have a couple of friends on as it gets a little bit closer to release, but um, for the actual collecting world, um, it's a good thing that it got delayed, simply due to the fact that um, there's a lot of other products that were supposed to hit the hit the market. Um, today, I believe, the same day that, that was the original release. So at least the UFC kind of won't get caught up in that. But um, nonetheless, it stinks. I'm always ready to open cards. Well, let's start first here with a few headlines uh, on the show. We'll give a shout-out to our friends at VigilanteMMA.com. They usually are bringing us the headlines this week, and you can follow them on Twitter at VigilanteMMA. Let's start first, Dave, which I guess is the biggest headline to come out of this past week, and this is as a result of UFC Fight Night 48, where the UFC was in China, their second ever time in China, and when they go to just about every other country other than America and Canada, for the most part, the UFC brings their own officials, because that country or province or state or territory in another country doesn't really have a governing body about the sport of mixed martial arts. So the UFC handpicks its own uh, judges and referees and brings them over to wherever the country is. This was the case once again for China. The UFC has done this several times. Now, after the first two fights of UFC Fight Night 48 in Macau, China, Dana White was not happy uh, with some of the judging. And one of the judges... Uh, one of the five judges that the UFC brought over, his name was Howard Hughes. And after the first two fights, D 
Dana White came over and told Hughes to get out of there. And this is the first time, maybe not the first time any organization has done that, but the first time the UFC has pulled one of the judges from an event. Now, again, most times they can't do it because it's a state running the event here in America or a province running into Canada, so they couldn't do that. But uh, Dana White himself pulled the uh, judge out, and one of the other, I guess, two replacement judges or side judges came in and officiated uh, or judged the rest of the card. And this sets a, a dangerous precedent, Dave. Um, an organization cannot take out a referee or a judge just because they don't like the calls that they're making. That's not how sports work. That's not really how any sport works. Now, luckily, this I hate to belittle what we're t the sport we're talking about, Dave, but I think this would have garnered much more attention if this was like a team sport or something. If uh, you saw Roger Goodell, you know, pulling out a referee during the middle of the game because he didn't like a call, you know, that would garner real big headlines. But it's still a really big deal, and you know, the UFC has issued apology, and Dana White's apologized. But at the end of the day, I know he gets he, he you know he's a fiery guy. He gets riled up. You know, he's an emotional guy, but. This is uh, this is unacceptable. I mean, you you can't do something like this. I, I don't care where you're at, or how you don't like the judges. This is unacceptable. And I, I I mean, maybe we already know Dana White has had some health problems that limits him to travel. But he, I I think that the UFC should not let him go to any other events outside of the UFC, uh, outside of the can Canada and the United States. I mean, even if he says he won't do it again, why tempt fate? Just you can't have this happen. This, this is uh, utterly unacceptable. I got I got a hard time with a couple of things, Jim. It didn't happen during a fight. And f from that point of view, I feel okay about it because it didn't affect any fights. The the gentleman that was the judge got to judge two fights. I understand that Dana shouldn't have to shouldn't be able to remove him, but it didn't do anything to the fight card by removing that judge. I don't know. I can't speak. Um, I don't know how it works with the judges. Are there extra judges on hand? Um, you yeah, know, said there were five judges there, so obviously there were two backups. Okay, so you know how many fights did that guy miss? Like, do they rotate? That kind of information, I don't know. There's a couple of questions. One, how did we find out that this judge got pulled? And it it doesn't – I agree that the promoter of the event shouldn't be pulling judges away. But if he's doing a terrible job and the UFC is paying – they're paying those judges because they're self-regulating themselves, shouldn't there be some sort of um, – the word's escaping me, but shouldn't there be some sort of grading scale? Like, if if the other two, if everybody on the planet scores at 30 to 27, you know, and then this guy says the other guy won 30 to 26, clearly he's not doing a good job. Shouldn't there be a way for the self-regulating body to say, we don't need you judging any more fights tonight? Well, again, it's a sticky situation because it's in it's in China. You know, the UFC is bringing these own, own officials, and it just begs the question that after two fights, if you didn't think he was good enough to judge anymore on that card, then why did you pick him to go to China with you? It, it, you know what I mean? If, if, if those two fights yeah. for a let's not forget, Dave, this is a fight pass event. Two fights on the undercard. This is not big time. You know, decisions going down. This is not title fight. This is not main event pay per views. These are four people who fought in these two fights that chances are maybe are, are not going to ever fight for a UFC title. You know what I mean? It's not big time fights. And he got that upset over a judge that his organization picked to pay to fly over to China. 
I mean, it's it's ridiculous. It, it absolutely is ridiculous. And yeah, like you said, did it probably really impact the rest of the eight fights on that card because uh, Mr. Hughes wasn't judging? No, probably not. But even in the initial report that I saw, I believe it was Junkie, they said that Dana White agreed with Hughes's first judging decision of the first fight. He was more outraged on the second fight. So how can you go from saying, well, all right, I could see that, and the next one, oh, this guy's a complete idiot. I got to get him out of here. I, I mean, it's just it's just a complete jump, and it it shows that sometimes that Dana White just jumps the gun on some things, and you know he has to he has to calm down <laughs> sometimes, you know. And if this is not an example of that, then I don't know what is. Yeah, um, you know, it's weird. Here's another thing. His Dana's got. You got to give him a little bit of credit because you said fight pass, prelims, probably never going to fight for a title. Does anybody have that kind of passion <laughs> other than Dana White to be like, look, you're screwing these undercard guys? Like, you know what I mean? To to take that big of a step, um, you know, that man right there has got some. Uh, he's very passionate about his product. But I, hey, didn't, uh, I didn't say he wasn't. I said he was a mo I'm just saying he jumps the gun sometimes. And I hey, think this was jumping the gun a little bit. Hey, this is our live show, so this may seem a little weird, but can we um our good friend Ray Flores is watching and he said that he's got some experience with athletic commissions, how the judges do. Can we call him via this gonna, method? I can send him an invite here and let's see if he can uh Ray, if you're watching, be on the lookout for an invite or something. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see if he gets if he can join. All right. Well, yeah. Th this is uh, like I said, it's a different situation because it's the UFC making this not uh, a weight class. We'll we'll see if anything really happens from this. You know, we've seen an apology, and whatnot. But like I said. I don't think honestly it's too harsh of a deal to say Dana White shouldn't be at the non like North American events. If he wants to go over there and do the press tours and stuff before him and so forth, but I, I think that he shouldn't be there, at least for a little bit. And he even said that he wants to travel less anyway. So to me, I, I think it kinda kills two birds with one stone. I think he kinda almost has like has to have like a self imposed uh suspension here. <laughs> yeah, uh Ooh. I mean, I don't know. We'll we'll see what happens. I, I just think that, you know, again, like we said, it wasn't uh something that was a, a big time championship deal. It it you know, it wasn't uh caught on camera or anything. It you know, was just seen uh you know by people around there. But you know, this could have been a way bigger deal uh than what it was. But um yeah, definitely man, definitely uh interesting situation. Uh, if Ray Flores can join us, we'll talk more about that, but um, I want to skip ahead, Dave, to uh, some Bellator news, and that's uh, two, two fronts things on the Bellator news. One, we have Stefan Bonner, who is coming out of retirement to sign with uh, Bellator, and I guess uh, they're kind of comparing this to uh, Tito Ortiz you know, kind of coming over after uh, retirement and going there, and he's 37 years old, uh, he has not fought since losing to Anderson Silva at UFC uh, 153. He is in the UFC Hall of Fame. It's been about, uh, that's roughly a little over two years since uh, he has fought in mixed martial arts. And uh, Bellator expects him to fight uh, sometime before the end of 2014. Now, I don't know whether Bellator reached out to Bonner or Bonner reached out to Bellator. It doesn't really say. It says that um, you know he you know he, he's talk about Tito Ortiz. He calls out Tito Ortiz. I don't know if we'll get to see that fight, but I think if you're Bellator and Stefan Bonner comes to you and says, "Hey, I want to have a couple fights with your organization," why would you say no? You know what I mean? It, I, I mean, you have an instant name that fans know that you can get some uh, great viewers with. So if you're Bellator, why not? Probably won't cost you that much, and you know, if he's bad, you know, so be it. But, you know, you can at least grab a little ratings and, you know, why not roll the dice a little bit here? Yeah, um, Stefan Bonner's good because he's multifaceted. Um, you can use him in, like, a tough type scenario if they do another one of those, another one of those shows. Um, he can announce, um, you know, he's got his, 
the other thing I think is weird um, with Bellator, like with Tito and with Stefan Bonner, they all have their own brands. So I wonder if we're going to start seeing, like, Punch Buddies on the Bellator Steel, <laughs> like how we see Punishment and all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, it, it's a good signing. Um, the unfortunate thing with the signing of Tito and of Stefan Bonner is the fact that you have no footage, none. So, like, when you're hyping the fight, all we're going to see is a f – how, how old did you say Bonner was? 38? Uh, 37. All we're going to see is a 37-year-old guy shadow boxing. You know, th th his entire career, they can't show a lick of it on Spike. <laughs> so, hey, um, before we move on, I'm gonna we're going to try one thing, and you tell me if you can hear it. I'm going to... Ray asked me to put him on speaker. So All right, let's I sent him the invite on Google Plus, but we'll we'll see. We'll try this method. Can you hear it ringing? I hear it ringing. Ray Flores from ESPN 1000. How are you? Good, man. Good. Can you hear Jim? Hey, how's it going, Ray? Absolutely. What's going on, guys? Uh, you know, I, as you guys are talking about this, I think you guys are doing a great job of, of you know, breaking down what happened. It, at the UFC fight night in Macau, but I do have experience, guys, working with various athletic commissions, uh, doing ring outs and everything else, and things that I've been able to pick up on. I've worked with Nevada, I've worked out in California, Florida, Texas, um, you know, in New York. The major athletic commissions I've had the opportunity to work with, and to get to your point, do they do judges rotate? Absolutely. Very rarely do you find a card that has, like, let's say that there's six or seven fights. Very rarely. Do you just have the same three judges? And if you have five judges, as you did on Saturday, you'll get different combinations. So let's say you have, you know, Sal Motto, 20 weeks, and Adelaide Bird. Well, then you will have, you have five judges, so you'll have a different combination. Next time you have Sal Motto, uh, let's say John McCarthy was a judge, and then uh, Herb Dean, if he was a judge. You have different combinations of the sorts. So very rarely do you get you know, consistent back to back. I, you know, I can't even recollect the last time at a, on a major event where you will get the same three judges back to back fights because they will give them a rest and then they'll rotate somebody else in, and that's the way it works. So, what's crazy to me though, guys, is that Dana White had the fight scored almost identical to what the judge that he pulled on the first fight. He agreed with the judge. And then he decides <laughs> to pull him after the second fight. That kind of baffles me. Ray, I'm going to speak for Jim. It sounds like you're in complete agreement with what Jim was saying. Um, ba basically, completely outraged. You know, that kind of stuff can't happen. And, you know, I'm kind of I'm kind of hanging. Um, like I said, I don't think... If they're self-regulating the the event I, I don't see what the problem is with Dana saying you know we're in charge and you're no longer needed tonight but that argument is you know we can go on and on about that but what well, can the here's, here's the problem here's, and, and I'll let you get to your next point but here's my thing the way other people can look at it is, from the opposite side is let's say he doesn't think that a fight is going um he didn't agree with the you know judge's scorecards or whatever. But let's just say, and I know that Dana probably won't do this. Let's say that there is uh, like a John Jones uh, down the line, maybe in a year and a half, two years from now, a John Jones Kane Velasquez super fight that could maybe do Cowboy Stadium. But John Jones has to get past, let's say Phil Davis. What's to say? And, and, and for some reason, or, or think of somebody else that's obscure. And let's say John Jones is defending his title overseas, where the UFC governs their own fights. What's to say that Dana White, that if he pulled the judge now, cannot go or can go to the judges before the fight and say, okay, um, no matter what happens, if this goes to the scorecards, Jones is getting this fight because we need to make this $50 million fight at Cowboy Stadium. Right. I'm not saying that will happen. But what's to say that it won't happen with what we saw on Saturday? So so then that question leads me to this one, and uh, Ray, you can go, and then Jim, you can go. W what, with the global domination that the UFC wants to have, 
what do they have to do? Because this clearly can't happen over and over again. What do they need? What do they need to do to make sure that this doesn't happen? What you need to do, Dave, is they. Here's the problem. It, it's twofold. It's you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't. They hired Mark Radner away from the Nevada State Athletic Commission, who held that position for years and years and years to work on expanding and getting themselves regulated in every state they are and regulated in all but one state, which is New York, and we all know why that is the problem. But the UFC cannot, I don't think it's smart moving forward, and I know that they're probably facing no other recourse. You need to have an independent agency regulating world MMA. And I know that the different countries don't have that, but I think you need to have an independent organization, the same way you have with drug testing when it comes to you know, the World Anti-Doping Agency and, and Nevada. You need to have that when it comes to MMA. So let's say down the line if Bellator wants to go global and you know Titan FC wants to go global or some of these other companies. Right now, I, I think, what, what is it done? Um, um, there, there are a couple other companies that are looking to go global. One you FC. need to have an independent agency kind of oversee all of them. Because the UFC police in themselves, yes, they are about the integrity of sport, but when you have big money on the table, that would be like a boxing promoter picking the, the judges and the referees and even, let's say, you know, Sid Kaiser now, who is no longer with the Nevada State Athletic Commission. Let's say that a boxing promoter were to get Bob Arum or, or Golden Boy or Don King were to get Keith Kaiser and they go to, let's say, Kazakhstan and Gennady Golovkin is defending the world title up there. And Don King says, if you heard Tom Loeffler is the promoter of K2 of Gennady Golovkin, says, I'm going to pick my own judges. I'm going to pick the judges. I'm going to pick the, the referees. Keith Kaiser is going to handle all that. Do you really think that would sit well in the eyes of the general sports public? Right. Who do you think they're going to go to? They're going to go to the, the mentality of the judges and the referees are going to be what's best for business. That's what you need to have independent agency oversee all of this. And, uh, Ray, like I was saying, uh, I, you know, I, it doesn't have to be forever, but... You know, Dana White has said he wants to travel less, and with this incident, do you think it's just time maybe Dana White just doesn't go to these overseas events anymore because of this incident? It kind of takes, you know, it doesn't have to be a specific length of time, but I think he should maybe just focus on doing the events uh, here in the U.S. and Canada and, and not maybe not worry about some of these overseas events, especially after this incident. Jim, I completely agree with you. I, here's my thing. If you police yourself, then when you do something wrong, you should be at least punished in some way, shape, or form. So, Jim, when, you, when you're talking about that, I think what you should do is you should, the, you know, Mark Ratner needs to, and the Fertitas have to say, wait a minute, Dana, listen, an apology is not going to cut it. You have to kind of be on ice from overseas events for, let's say, the next three or four months. And who am I to say that? But, but guess what? The UFC has competent guys like Dave Schaller, and they have guys overseas that are running, you know, Tom Wright, who does a marvelous job, and, you know, the higher-ups in, in UFC Asia and UFC UK and England, they do a great job. I just think that something has to be done to where this is an issue, because as Dana White just came back from, they had the kickoff press conference to talk about the Ken Velasquez um, match up with Fabrizio Verdum November 15th in Mexico City. So who is going to regulate MMA down there? The UFC. So it, it, it's almost, you know, it, 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 I think it's, it's hypocritical because, yeah, Dana came out and apologized, but yeah, I know he's promoting a fight, but he'll probably be down there in Mexico City in November. Mm -hmm. And what, what's to say that he may not like the way that, let, let's say this, Let's say for, the, the judging is, is bad, and, and Dave, the judge who was supposed to, that got pulled from a cow, was supposed to judge the main event. It was to the point where the, the cage announcer, who was, who was not Bruce Buffer, he was the, the English UK uh, or uh, cage announcer, I think I'd announce to be correct, he read the judge's names, and it had the judge from the first two fights because the production truck was not told of the change. Right. It was not realized until after the event. So he 
even the production truck got it wrong because they didn't even know of the change. So it did affect, like, let's say the bits being uh, come refined. I know you're going to get into a detail, but let's say that would have gone through the scorecards. And let's say the, the judge that Dana put in his place got it wrong even worse than what this guy did. There's so many intangibles, guys. That's why they're athletic commissions. That's why, like it or not, you know, Indiana has an athletic commission. Every, you know, has an athletic commission. I think Nancy does a, a solid job of, you know, of, of, you know, regulating fights around here in, in Illinois. And there, there is, uh, there's a checks and balance system. The same way we are with our country, there's a checks and balance system. You have, you know, someone overlooking and overseeing things. Judges make mistakes. Referees make mistakes all the time, but you need to have an independent agency so that promoters, even though they do a lot of good for the sport, cannot have free reign and it be the Wild West, and that's what it is when it comes to when the UFC goes overseas. Now, I know that MMA hasn't expanded much, and it's very much in its infancy, and they have done a great job with Mark Radner, but guys, something has to be done, because I will tell you this, and I'm not on my boxing soapbox here, but we've heard of the corruption that has gone on in boxing and stuff. But can you imagine if there would have been something like this for a heavyweight title fight or let's say a Floyd Mayweather fight or Manny Pacquiao fight in Macau, China? Oh, dear heavens, man. <laughs> Holy cow, it would have been the death of combat sports in every part of the globe. <laughs> Jim, do you notice when Ray's talking... How we both are sitting here attentively looking at our screens like we're being schooled, <laughs> like like Ray's an instructor and we're just taking notes. <laughs> I just noticed that when I was he was talking, I was like, "You're listening just as attentively as me." <laughs> anyway. Well, I gotta make sure because it's coming over the phone too that I can uh, make yeah. sure I can hear everything. But no, absolutely, uh, great stuff, Ray. Uh, thanks for thanks for coming on uh, impromptu here and talk about this. Not a problem, guys. Hey, I'm glad I was able to hop out a little bit, guys. I mean, it's just in terms of the, the conversation and stuff, I've been able to work with some of the best athletic commissions in the entire country. Very fortunate to do so. And some of the things that I've seen, uh, there, there is a reason why they exist. And, and, and a guy, you know, the people that are in charge, Andy Foster does a great job in California, the new gentleman who escapes me at the moment in Nevada is doing a great job. And, and guys, I wish I would have better technology, but, uh, you know, the money that I would spend for extra technology is going to my student loans, as you know about, Jim. So, oh, man. Don't, you know, don't, really don't remind me. A lot better technology to be able to join you guys on Live in Living Color on TV. All right. Thanks again, Ray. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks, Ray. You the man. All right, that was Ray Flores from uh, ESPN 1000, ESPN.com. Uh, there in Chicago, at Ray Flores 86 to follow him on Twitter, talking a little bit about his experience as a announcer and uh, you know play-by-play -play guy, all that stuff within mixed martial arts and combat sports. Talking about this, so uh, real quick before we end headlines, uh, that was awesome, Ray stopping by. Uh, sticking with the Bellator, <laughs> going back to Bellator, unfortunately, um, maybe not unfortunately. No, just kidding. Um, they cut some fighters recently and we usually when we talk about fighters getting cut it's the UFC we don't typically talk about Bellator fighters getting cut Dave in fact I don't think we've ever talked about Bellator fighters getting cut in the over two years we've done this show but it came out that some of their more notable fighters uh, have been cut from the organization this past week including former light heavyweight champion Attila Vague and also former tournament winner Shabalat Shamalayev also, uh, Mighty Mo, Brian the Beast Baker, uh, Des Green, um, Ron Sparks, Rodney Wallace, uh, some other notable names on this list. Altogether, 13 fighters have been recently cut from the organization. Just looking over that list, Dave, I understand Scott Coker's in. He's trying to bring in some new, fresh talent and whatnot, and some of these guys I get. I actually get Attila Vey getting cut because in the couple fights he's had, main eventing and title fights, they haven't been particularly exciting, and he hasn't been drawing people in. So I totally get Attila Vey, but I do not get uh, Shabalat Shamalayev. Uh, this guy has been nothing but in exciting, whether in victory or defeat. The guy's only fought 14 times professionally. I believe he's only 26, 27 years old. He has a really bright future ahead of him. Um, that one kind of surprised me. Out of the other, the, all the other names in this list are veterans of the sport who've been around for a while. 
you know, have ha- had some good fights, have had some bad fights. I can kind of understand those guys, but I the Shabalat Shamalive one kind of um, you know miss. I, I guess I'm a little bit uh, miffed at that one. Yeah, it's you know what? If you look at the list, Jim, the one that's on Junkie, it has their fight records and then their their um their Bellator fight records. And of the 19 that were cut, I think it was 19, right? No, uh, I think it was 13. 13. Yeah, 13. Of the 13 fighters, four of them have a 500 record or worse. So that means nine of them had winning records and got cut. <laughs> so I don't know if it's a money thing, if it's a you know. Um, Shabalat Shalomayev doesn't live... He's not in the States, right? No, he's one of the Russian guys that trains with uh, Shlomenko. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, same thing with... Is it, uh, I don't think Attila Vag. I think Vag's from, like, Croatia? Yeah. Or so Bulgaria? I wonder, you know, for the time being, you know, they're kind of maybe trying to trim some of that, um, you know, flying guys, you know, from Russia to Hammond, Indiana you know, or to, you know, where you're at there in, in Michigan. But it's – the guys that they're cutting aren't terrible fighters. So th- there has to be an underlying reason why. And for the life of me, I don't know what it is. <laughs> like a stand make room for Stefan Bonner, right? <laughs> yeah. You, you 13, need to leave. You old man, you get to come in. Hey, is that our last headline? Yes, sir. Okay, real quick. Um, Do you? This is from my friend Aaron sending messages in. Why is Gina talking to Borator? That means Bellator. He doesn't like. Um, he why? Doesn't like why is uh, Gina talking to Bellator? It's fairly simple. Scott Coker was the first one that signed Gina Carano many, many, many moons ago, and mm-hmm. I we talked about it a couple weeks ago. I think Carano, if she wants to come back, I don't think she wants to cut to 135. I think she wants to fight at 145. And what's one of the divisions Bellator is bringing back? 145. Do you think that gut gut feeling signs with UFC or signs with Bellator? Go. I okay. I'll put. I think she has a 70 percent chance of signing with Bellator. I agree. You add in weight class, Scott Coker. I, I think you got to, in less, in less pressure, three things right there. UFC, he has more money, more weight cut, more pressure. You know, it's, it, so I, I think the, that's what she's weighing right now. Because, don't get me wrong, you could still shoot movies while, while fighting. It's not like she has to exclusively just be a fighter. And I don't think she's going to exclusively be a fighter. But signing with Viacom, an entertainment company, basically, that owns Bellator... That yep. opens up a lot of options for her to be on not just movies but TV. You know, uh, they got to fill 24 hours a day, right? Seven days a week of uh, airtime, don't they? Hey, Jim, I saw an article on Facebook that the producers at Spike are looking for men and women who have beef between the ages of 21 and 55 to basically like a bully beatdown type thing. But what from the sounds of it, what would happen is, like, if me and you had beef, we would train with, like, Stefan Bonner, Randy Couture, some of those guys, okay. and then we would end up fighting each other. That's interesting for for Bellator, huh? We should just create a beef to get on the show. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. That would be dope. I mean, we're not going to do that. Okay, yeah. let's move on here. Uh, let's give a shout-out to our friend uh, at MMAinsider.net. You can follow them on Twitter at MMAinsider.net. And, of course, our friends at MMAforlife.ca. Follow them on Twitter at underscore MMAforlife as we head into breaking down two UFC Fight Nights, Dave, UFC Fight Night 48 and 49. And let's talk about the main card for UFC Fight Night 48. First, four fights shown on the Fight Pass. The first fight was actually for the uh, delayed featherweight contract fight for the Ultimate Fighter China. And this was between Gao Ging Ning and Jiapan Yang. And this was not a very exciting fight. Um, this was a fight where both guys seemed really hesitant to strike at each other. And when they did come forward, it seemed like 
each other had a hard time hitting each other. It just didn't seem like a lot was landing. Uh, nothing really crazy happened. Uh, Ning ended up getting the victory. He was the more aggressive of the two as he threw 103 strikes to just 82 for Yang, uh, landed 41 to just 24 for Yang. Uh, and Ning had the advantage there. Ning also uh, was credited for two or three takedown attempts, just one of four for Yang. Uh, this was a fight where just, I, you know, I don't know if it was layoff. You know, both these guys, when we were talking about the fights, you know, only had fought once in the past, like, 18 months. You know, then you add the, you know, first time being in the UFC and all that, even though it was in their home country. You know, he, he gets the UFC contract, but, um, you know, I was watching this fight with my friend, and I was like, man, the loser of this fight, they're not getting a contract. I mean, this is, you have to win to get a contract, because I don't think you're sticking around if you lost with a performance like this. Yeah, this is one where they give you the trophy, and they're like, uh, yeah, we don't think you're going to make it to the end of this contract. <laughs> No, it, you know, like you said, it wasn't a very um, – the, the, the word that I would use to describe this fight is awkward. Like you said, when they came, when they came uh, at one another, it was, it was like there was a weird force field, um, like in certain parts of each other. Like, they just didn't, like you said, they just didn't want to hit each other. Um, yeah, not the best fight to kick off, you know, the main card of the fight pass. And, um, you know, we talked about it beforehand about the layoff, about the, uh, you know, it was almost a year and a half for the, for one of them before they got, since they had fought and coming back from that kind of layoff and then under the bright lights in your home country for the UFC, there's a lot of stuff, probably more mental than it is physical. If these guys were on the undercard of a Chicago show, we may see two completely different fighters. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised Dana White just didn't put in another fighter because he didn't like how it was going. See what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get to the next fight of the evening, uh, which saw another guy that was uh, originally from the Ultimate Fighter China and Liapang Zhang as he took on former Tough Nations contender Brendan O'Reilly. And uh, this fight, kind of, uh, Zhang, even though he ended up with a very uh, a dominant performance, he was very slow to the start. And very kind of lackadaisical in that first round. I really thought he let O'Reilly kind of push the pace in that first round. As you know, you look out the total strikes for the first round. O'Reilly threw 41 uh, strikes, landed 25. Uh, 34 of uh, was landed by Zhang. 0 2 on the takedowns. It just seemed like you know Zhang landed some, but it seemed like O'Reilly was definitely kind of pushing the pace a little bit. What it gave him that first round, and then in rounds two and three, we saw Zhang be able to get up close, but then take O'Reilly down and really dominate with great positioning. I thought he, he's really big for the weight class, a guy that used to fight at 170. You know he's really long and lanky for the weight class, and I think for O'Reilly after he got hit a couple times. I tell you what, for a guy that they said was a Brazilian jiu-jitsu brown belt, Dave, he made several tactical errors on the ground, in my opinion, did O'Reilly. He had several opportunities to get out, switch. You know, he was turning the wrong way in some positions. And, um, you know, I'm not a, a black belt or anything by any stretch of the imaginations. I'm just obviously an observer and, a, and I comment on things. But I've watched a lot of fights in my day, almost eight years' worth of UFC fights, and you know I know through the broadcast which way you should be going. And Brendan O'Reilly was not doing uh, a lot of things right, and Zhang was. And when it was all said and done, Zhang outstruck O'Reilly 130 to 74. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's the domination. That yeah, and his face was bloody. He almost got finished uh, very close with a submission and also just the accumulation of punches there toward the end. But O'Reilly hung on. Uh, to lose a unanimous decision, 29-28 uh, uh, on one scorecard and 30-27 on uh, two others. Yeah, that was O'Reilly's first loss uh, as a professional. Um, and, you know, I read in a couple of places for, i got to look at the name again, for Lee Pang, you know, O'Reilly probably wasn't the biggest step up in competition from where he was, um, you know, winning the Ultimate Fighter. He fought another Ultimate Fighter guy. You know the UFC likes to do that a lot. Um, you get guys who are kind of at that same level. So it wasn't a huge step up, but, um, you know, he, the the task was there to beat O'Reilly. He defeated O'Reilly, and um, like you said, there was a couple of tactical errors. 
um, on the ground. Um, I'm no expert either. I know I look like one. You know, these are those those steroids there. Those are real, real deal. Um, but yeah, um, Li Peng. Um, I would like to see him not fight in China on his next fight. Um, you know, maybe bring him over to England or maybe bring you know bring him to the states for whatever. But um, you know, give him a little bit step up in competition and see how well he does. But um, you know, I'm not a big fan of them keeping those guys. Um, you know, keeping them keeping them in their home country. Let's see what they can do. Let's try not to give anybody a home field advantage or any any of that kind of stuff. The co-main event of the evening was at 170 pounds as Tyron Woodley took on Young Hun Kim. And as we were breaking this fight down, Dave, we said Young Hun Kim kind of has to go back to what has made him so successful in the UFC, getting inside, using the clinch game, and getting his opponents down and suffocating them. And we said if he was going to be wild like he had been the last two fights, even though he's been successful, he's won with two consecutive knockouts, Tyron Woodley's not a guy that you can mess around with. Because if you get wild, he can land a haymaker and knock you out. And that's exactly what happened in this fight. Kim got a little wild and crazy, threw a, maybe a little ill-advised spitting back fist there. Woodley sat it, countered with a perfect overhand right, and it just sent Kim spiraling to the canvas. Woodley followed up and threw a few more on the ground before the referee had to stop this one in the first round at the 101 marker. And this was a great bounce-back win for Tyron Woodley after his bad performance against Rory McDonald in his last fight. And this is a fight that keeps him relevant and keeps him within the top five of the UFC welterweight division. And for Kim... You know, your last two fights, you know, you got lucky. You got you fought guys who, yeah, are very talented in Eric Silva and John Hathaway, but guys that don't possess the type of knockout power that Tyron Woodley does. So you got a little bit lucky. Now you learn that you can't go in wild and crazy. And while it's exciting, you know, you face top guys like Tyron Woodley, you're going to get finished if you do that. Do spinning back fist ever work? Uh, ask Matt Sarah. Yeah. I mean, like... <laughs> No, so, I mean, chill, chill they, they, can. Like they can, but you have to keep them tight. Yeah. No, I mean, because that, that's basically what led to the finish for Woodley. Um, yeah, th this is uh, th this was a real good um, bounce back for Woodley. It, it helps him out in a couple of ways. One, he went in, he got a finish. Um, and as he said, uh, I'm reading on MMA Junkie, um, the short notice fight was a welcome challenge after his performance against Roy McDonald. He said, quote, at the time, the UFC thought I was helping them out, but they were helping me out. I needed to redeem myself. And um, that's exactly what he did. You know, he took a short notice fight, helped out the UFC. That's always good. Got an, um, a finish and got a finish early. So now, um, you know, people start backing out of fights or whatever. He's ready to step right in there and claim what – what he thinks is rightfully his, you know, and that's a shot at the belt. But, um, yeah, that, 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 that's a I, – I don't know if that fight is a huge victory because of the, the competition that he fought, but the ability to go out there, get that victory, and uh, move on to uh, higher competition, um, good deal for Tyron Woodley. All right, the main events of the evening, middleweight division, the Count Michael Bisbing took on former Strike Force middleweight champion Kung Lee. And, Dave, this was a fight where Kung Lee, I don't know if it was layoff, I don't know if it was age, I don't know if it's strategy. I think you can kind of throw in, uh, you know, you can also throw in the quality of the opponent. You can kind of throw in a couple different things here, but this was a fight where Kung Lee was flat-footed. He was not moving around. He was not throwing with variety. He was not throwing in combinations. He was not throwing particularly fast. And against a guy like Michael Bisbang, if you're not doing something to get in his face and you're not hitting him hard, he's a guy that has great footwork, great head movement, great conditioning. And, you know, if you're throwing stuff slow or, you know, telegraphing things or being really one-dimensional, he fi he can figure that out pretty easily. And that's what he did in this fight. He figured it out after the first round where he took some kicks and 
you know, took a couple counters, maybe lost that first round. And then this, the second round he learned, he's like, all right, Kung Lee's standing flat-footed. He's not moving around very well. I can move around this guy. I can run circles, throw punches of bunches, and get out before he can hit me with anything crazy. And that's exactly what he did. I mean, you look at, just just look at, this is just thrown strikes, Dave. Michael Bisping out through Kung Lee, 270 to 110. <laughs> That's just in throwing. So obviously Kung Lee not being active, and the, usually the guys that throw more strikes usually end up winning. You look at the the striking totals, 92 to 38. I mean, he, he was just going in there and throwing, and Kung Lee did not have an answer for this stuff. And yeah, you know, he got hit with that shot in his eye that messed up his vision, but hey, that's what happens when you get hit and 92 times. Yeah, yeah so he's bound to hit, and the punches and bunches accumulated. And Michael Bisming finally got the uh, stoppage there, capping off with a big knee in the clinch in the fourth round at the 57-second marker. And I think we, I think we may have saw the end uh, of Kung Lee as well competing yeah, would, in uh, MMA. I would agree that um, I think I think Kung Lee could be a very, very, very valuable asset for the UFC moving forward with their, um, you know, with their. Um, What's the proper word there? With, with expansion the, into Asia. Yes, with their yeah, perfect. I think that he could be a perfect guy. Um, he was a world champion. Um, you know, he's fought on the biggest stage in the world, and you know, I think that they could use him f for that global expansion. Um, you know, put him in front of you know Good Morning China or whatever their TV shows are <laughs> over there. But uh, y you know, whatever happened to Michael Bisming having pillow fist? So much for that, huh? He, uh... Matt, he he was he was throwing everything at Kung Lee, man. Uh, this was one of the best performances I've seen uh, Bisbing had, especially after how bad his last fight was. Yeah, one I took a couple things away. One, his combinations were crisp. Two, the power that he had. E either he has a lot of power, or Kung Lee's got a lot of scar tissue that breaks easily. <laughs> um, and three. Bisbing didn't seem tired to me at all. And at 185 pounds, anybody have better cardio than him? I, I don't think so. I mean, he's he's always had good cardio. I mean, this is I mean, it's just, you know, he showcase I mean, when you throw 270 strikes and it looks like you can throw 200 more, you know, you got you got a gas tank. I mean, sir, I like you know, that's one of those questions where like Seriously, at a hundred at a hundred and eighty five pounds, is there somebody with better cardio? I really don't. I really don't think so. I mean, I, and you would, I really don't. <laughs> and you wouldn't think it would be Michael Bisping, but you know, I'm just looking at the top fifteen, and yeah, that that man may have the best cardio at one hundred eighty five pounds. So, yeah, solid victory for Michael Bisping. Um, it looks like via Twitter and Facebook and stuff. He wants to fight Luke Rockhold. Um, I, I'm good with that. I like that Luke Rockhold fight. I don't. I don't see why not. I mean, that's you know, he's two guys. You know, in the top ten, he's got no problem with that. So we'll see. Everyone uh, likes to call Michael Bisbing, so you know he has no shortage of people that want to fight him. So <laughs> he, you know, he he can. Uh, he could, I'm sure he probably doesn't even have to be presented fights to Joe Silva anymore. I think he can just go, all right, who called me out this week? And, uh, you know, he probably tells Joe Silva who who, uh, who he wants to fight next. But let's move on to UFC Fight Night 49 from uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma this past uh, Saturday. And this was on Fox Sports 1. First fight of the evening, featherweight division as Chaz Skelly took on Tom uh, Ninamaki. Once again, Dave, uh, Ninamaki was able to get on top assert some control, then once again he lost position and got submitted for the second consecutive fight here in the UFC, and uh, Skelly walks away with the rear naked choke victory at the 235 marker, and uh, Ninamaki probably gets cut, but I, you know, for a guy that has a lot of submission victories in his credit, you wouldn't think he'd be so susceptible to the rear naked choke, but he does the same thing two fights in a row. Yeah, um, not the best start to a, uh, you know, to being on the main card, you know, all that time that you've been in, in mixed martial arts and you finally made the UFC, obviously this is your second fight, but you're kicking off a free card on Fox Sports 1, you know, 
you're like, oh, this is my big break, you know, you're going to get a knockout or a submission, going to get some big sponsors, and then uh, your worst nightmare happens again. <laughs> That's uh, not the best kickoff for Mr. Ninamaki, but uh, hey, is it the bright lights? Is it a mental thing? Um, I bet in practice that doesn't happen. But uh, Chas Skelly takes, uh, you know, takes the victory from the jaws of defeat. I guess, maybe maybe is a good way of putting it. But um, good for Chas Skelly, and I don't think we'll see Ninamaki back. The next fight of the evening was at 155 pounds as James Vick took on Valmer Lazaro, and. I tell you what, Dave, uh, for Lazaro, who I guess they said is more reserved, uh, conservative striker, guy that likes to uh, sit and counter, well, I think that went out the window uh, when James uh, Vick blitzkrieged him with uh, 94 thrown strikes in the first round, and uh, Lazaro figured out, all right, I don't think I'm going to be able to sit back and uh, counter this guy if he's coming right at me, and uh, Lazaro answered with... Uh, 91 thrown uh, of his own in that first round. All together, Dave, here are the, these are just, again, the thrown numbers. 227 thrown strikes for James Vick. Remember, this is a 15-minute fight. And Lazaro threw 236, to his credit. Uh, Vick was 0 for 1 on takedowns. Lazaro 4 for 10. Overall, landed. Lazaro outstruck Vick 96 to 83. This fight went down... Uh, to a unanimous decision, uh, two judges scoring at 29-28 for James Vick, uh, one judge uh, 30-27 for Vick. And I thought the first round was very close. I think both guys uh, you know, had some combinations, but I think I probably would have gave it to Vick. I think the takedown in the second gave Lazaro that round. I probably would have scored it for that. In the third round, I really do think it was a toss-up. I know it ended up being a unanimous decision, but I think the third round was very close. But, you know, both guys were throwing haymakers. But I think, uh, you know, Vic rocked Lazaro uh, a couple times in that round. And I think because of that, the judges gave uh, Vic that third round. And I think that's what led to the victory. Because if you look at the numbers, you know, it, it paints a really close fight. And it was a close fight. And, you know, this is a fight I think both guys will learn from. Because, you know, I talked about conditioning. You could tell both guys... We're definitely slowing down, you know, entering the second and then especially the third. And you saw a guy, you know, both guys leave a lot of openings that maybe more experienced guys, you know, uh, would capitalize on more. So while it was a very fun fight, a very exciting fight, Dave, um, definitely both guys will probably have to tighten some things up. But, you know, after, I, I hate to say it was a less down because it was, this, you know, it was a first round finish. But, you know, this almost felt like the kickoff fight and it ended up turning out awesome. Yeah, um, how James Vick was out for we said over a year. Uh, yeah, I I believe well just about I think he fought on that first when they brought back the fight nights. I think he fought on that, so that would have been like August of last year. So yeah, just about a full year. Yeah, I you know I took a couple of things away from it. Vick was gone for oh, I thought it was right you know right about a year, maybe a little bit longer. He didn't seem to have very much ring rust. Considering that big of a layoff, his cardio didn't seem to be an issue. And I thought Vic looked... Um, I thought he looked B to B plus-ish in the cage. I think there's plenty of room for improvement for Vic. There's plenty of room for improvement with both of these guys. Um, but knowing Vic from the Ultimate Fighter and everything, you know... I think that the ceiling is a little bit higher for James Vick. And like you said, um, got to be happy with the victory and got to be back at the gym as soon as possible um, because th there are holes in his game. And uh, he's got a smart – he's a smart guy, smart camp. He'll uh, clean up those holes and we'll see, I'm sure we'll see a new and improved James Vick in his next fight. And that was also Lazaro's UFC debut. So I gotta believe he definitely gets one or two more fights after a exciting fight like that. He got he got hurt in the first round, didn't it? Or I think he got like, hurt in like every round. <laughs> well, no, like it wasn't there something with his knee. Is that this? No, I mean he got he definitely got rocked in that first round. I don't I don't remember anything wrong with his. Uh... It might have been on the prelims. I thought 
Ah, anyway, cut that part out when you re-edit it. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next fight of the evening, which was at uh, catchweight. It was supposed to be 145, but with Clay Collard coming in on short notice to take on Max Holloway, it turned to a catchweight fight. And Dave, as we said, Collard, a guy making his UFC debut on short notice, taking on a guy who's you know very much a hot prospect in the 145 division, a guy who has a lot of skill in Max Holloway, a guy riding a two-fight winning streak. And while we thought Collard, you know, could go in there and you know, he would have a shot, obviously. Uh, you know, he, he with the short notice and everything, we thought Max Holloway would eventually uh, get on with his long and you know, long frame and uh, Chris strike, striking. And I think that was the case. Um, okay, now both guys threw uh, over 200 strikes. He had 219 thrown for Holloway and 213 for Collard. Now, if you throw that a lot of strikes, you you know, you hope to maybe land about 100 of those. Well. Max Holloway landed 137 to just 73 for Collard. And, you know, whether that's short notice, whether it's the range of Max Holloway, or, you know, what do you want to quit it to? You know, even if you throw the same, you got to land something. And Max Holloway was landing, and he was landing often. And Collard, you know, he tried his best to take Holloway down 1 of 10 in that category. Couldn't keep the fight there after getting peppered with shots. You know, almost had a 2 to 1 clip. And while he was being a very tough guy, Dave, he eventually succumbed to strikes at the 347 marker in the third round. And this was just an accumulation of punches. This was Max Holloway doing a good job of staying aggressive, you know, seeing the holes, seeing the opportunity to get punches uh, in on the head of Collard and eventually was able to take him out. Yeah. Um, the Co Clay Collard, I think if he fights a guy that doesn't have the output that Max Holloway does or just in your face nonstop. I think Clay Collard could beat a few uh, could beat a few guys at the UFC cuz his not going away type attitude um, could frustrate a lot of people. Max Holloway is not one of those people. Um, you know, like you said you you gave us the numbers Jim and that's uh that's very impressive um, to not only throw that much but land that much. And it wasn't even the full 15 minutes. It was, what was a total length? It was about like 13 minutes. Yeah. So in 13 minutes, that's pretty impressive. Um, but, yeah, um, this could have been a, a little bit more interesting of a fight had Collard had a full camp. But I think if he has a full camp, they don't make that fight. But um, hopefully they give Collard another shot. I wouldn't mind seeing him. Um, uh, I, I wasn't... Uh, I wasn't upset that he was in the cage with Holloway. And, uh, you know, Holloway moving up, and I, I I think this has to put him in the top 15, no? I put him right on the doorstep of it, and I think it puts him in another fight with a more with a more notable name. I mean, he's already fought uh, Conor McGregor and Leonard Garcia, some notable names, but it's going to be somebody that we know. Um, maybe like the loser of the Oliveria Lentz fight. I don't know, that just comes to mind. But oh, we'll man. see. Uh, and, and much like, you know, Lazaro before him, Collar's a guy that went in there, UFC debut, had an exciting fight, and a guy that I think we'll see again. The next fight of the evening was in the middleweight division as Francis Carmont took on Talas Lietes. And looking at the first round, Dave, we definitely thought that striking-wise that Carmont would probably be a little better uh, striker of the two, and looking at the landed numbers, Carmel outlanded uh, Leite 17 to 11, and I think uh, his kicks were very well. It seemed like uh, Leite is, you know, was being a, maybe a little more aggressive than he usually does, throwing a lot more hands. I think he maybe caught uh, Carmel a little off guard a little bit in that first round, but I think uh, the first round was close. I probably would have gave it to Carmel because of the kicks, and then in round number two, I think. Leite's, like I said, he was starting, you know, starting to, to throw the hands a lot more. I think he realized that Carmel was more content to throw kicks than throw hands, and I don't know if it was his decision, his coaches, or, or what they saw to like. They're like, hey, just go out there and give him a rush with the hands, you know, see what can happen. I almost feel like that's what they said. And he's like, all right. So I went out there, started the round, gave a rush with the hands, ended up rocking Carmel, dropped him, and then got the finish in the second round. Just 20 seconds into the second round. 
And for a guy who is not known for being exciting or flashy or knocking people out, you know, goes in there and knocks out Francis Carmel in the second round. Uh, you know, for a guy that you know was maligned not too long ago by the UFC, Dave, he now is riding a four-fight winning streak in the organization. Has beat a guy in the top ten, and you know, once again, he you know he's trying to make a run at the middleweight title again. Yeah. I was trying to look, Jim, when you were talking about it. Talis Latis, he won his last fight via TKO, just like this one, but he hadn't won a fight via knockout ever. Ever. So his last two fights were his first ever knockout finishes. You know, that's, that's what I'm saying. This guy, you know, <laughs> world-class Brazilian jiu-jitsu guy. <laughs> Not a knockout guy. And, you know, he goes in there and knocks out Francis Carmel, who all of a sudden goes from 6-0, and maybe one or two fights away from a title shot, much like Talos Leite's, you know, a guy more grappling-based, you know, maybe a little boring. Now all of a sudden he's lost three in a row, Dave, has been finished in two of them. He could get, I, or I, not two, no, no, that was a decision to, to Dalloway. But he could be cut now. He yeah. could go from six and zero now to the last last three, and he could be cut. Yeah, um, yeah. I thought Latest looked really good. He's on a roll. Um, he's gonna clearly get another step up in competition. Um, yeah, Carmont. Yeah, like I said, he started out six and zero. Now he's six and three. Um, the biggest problem that they have is he was ranked. Now clearly he's not gonna be ranked. But who do you give Francis Carmont? He's been kind of right at like that, you know, fighting guys who are seven and eight in the division. Who are you going to give him in the middleweight division now? There's really not not a whole lot of fights that you can book, uh, in my mind, unless he becomes like a gatekeeper. Uh, you can maybe give him Brad Tavares. Yeah, but who's that? I mean, that's a fight that if Tavares wins that fight, you know, that's a bigger win for Tavares than it would be for Carmont. Yeah, but when you're when you when you're on a three fight losing streak, I don't think you can uh, really yeah, be a, be really be a beggar, right? That's yeah, that's probably true. Because you, you're still hoping you have a job. <laughs> but yeah, this this uh, great performance by Latis, he's gonna shoot up the rankings. He's gonna get somebody uh, you know high up there, and you know for Carmel, hope he hopes he still has a job with the UFC. Other you know he's gotta go back to the drawing board here. He's got you know something. I know the quality of opponents, you know, increased, Dave. You know, but even so, he hasn't looked any shred of the guy we've seen in those previous six fights. Talis Latis moves up to number twelve, and Francis Carmel drops to number fifteen on the official UFC garbage rankings. Well, let's get to the co-main event of the evening at 170 pounds as Jordan Meehan took on Mike Quicksand Pile, and. I think it's not the end. I think he still has a lot of fight in him, but I think we saw the beginning of the end for Mike Powell because he's gotten rocked early in some fights. He's able to come back in some of them, but in this one, he just took a huge counter right to the jaw and just went crashing to the canvas. And this one, uh, you know, he didn't really even have to throw any more at the end there, did Jordan Meehan, to get this one stopped in the first round at 112. And... This was a very nice victory for Jordan Meehan. You could make a case it's the biggest one of his career. I think it really helps put him back on the map. You know, he fought Matt Brown a while ago. You know, he was he, you know had the little success in that fight, but eventually got finished. And, you know, this is his next chance at kind of getting a, a big fight on a big time, you know, well, maybe not a big time card, but you know what I mean? Fox Sports won Coming Event, and he's able to deliver against a crafty veteran in Mike Pyle. And, you know, we kind of see one career, you know, going towards the end there. And uh, Mike Pyle, we get to see one career kind of on his way up there. And uh, Jordan Meehan. Yeah, um, big win for Jordan. Um, you know, there was a, a bunch of circumstances coming into this fight. His father was arrested the day prior, had some legal issues uh, at the hotel, some crazy stuff like that. But, um, you know, his dad's normally in his corner. This is a big-time fight for Jordan, and he was able to look past all that, um, focus on his fight, get a finish. And um, I loved his post-fight speech where he said, I'm going to keep doing stuff like that because I like being in the co-main event main event slots of these cards. And um, I couldn't agree more. I think um, 
you know, quicksand probably on its way down, and obviously means probably on his way up. The main events of the evening pitted former UFC lightweight champion Ben Henderson against Rafael Dos Anjos, and very rarely, Dave, uh, do I walk away from a lot of events feeling shocked. I mean, there, there's been a few times, but this this is one of this has been one of those times. Rafael Dos Anjos knocking out Ben Henderson in the first round at the 231 marker, and this was just simply Benson getting caught. I mean, th this wasn't like a huge, you know, tactical error or anything, or Rafael Dos Anjos doing something extremely crazy or, you know, anything like that. It was a pretty even fight for the two minutes that it was going on. You know, Henderson was landing some kicks. You know, Rafael, you know, countered a little bit. Um, you know, Henderson, you know, wasn't able to get the one takedown. And then next thing you know, kind of in that, scramble after the takedown attempt. Rafael lands a big right, knocks him down. Big John has to step in and, and stop this one. And I know Benson was kind of complaining after the fight, but, you know, on initial watching, it did seem quick, but then they showed the replay, and you can kind of go, all right, you know, he did look pretty out of it. And, you know, you know, Big John's the best in the game for the reason. And, uh, you know, I think he made the right call on, on that. And, boy, Rafael Dos Anjos, you know, I, I was talking with some friends, and, you know, I'll bring it up with you. With this victory, I think that's enough for a title shot. I mean, he's already beat, you know, Donald Cerrone. Yeah, uh, he, he already had. He's uh, beat some other top guys here in the weight class, and you know, finishing Benson Henderson, who's never been knocked out before in his career, huge deal. And you know, we got to wait for Cerrone Alvarez because I think you and I already mentioned it when Alvarez signed. If Alvarez wins, he probably gets a title shot. But if Cerrone wins, it creates a whole different situation because of Dos Anjos' victory over him. That almost kind of makes Dos Anjos leapfrog Cerrone there. You know, you got a whole uh, host of circumstances there. But, um, you know, Rafael, you know, it's one thing to get a win, but to do it in emphatic fashion like this, it, it definitely it gives the UFC a very difficult choice of who to give uh, the winner of uh, Melendez and uh, Pettis. I'll tell you that much. Can you hear it? Yes. Okay. I just had to get that out. I had to get that out of the system. I had to purge that out. <laughs> All right. Um, no, it, it, there's definitely a... Um, there's a... A good problem for the UFC. Um, there, there's, there's good problems and there's bad problems. If Eddie Alvarez wins, I think most people who cover the sport would agree that Eddie Alvarez should probably fight the winner for the lightweight belt. Of those same people, the casual fan probably knows as much about Eddie Alvarez as they do Rafael Dos Anjos. And that's the one problem I think that the UFC is going to have. Does Dos Anjos earn, does he did he earn the title shot? I completely agree that he should probably fight for the belt, as should Alvarez. But can they book Melendez and Dos Anjos, or is that that's going to end up being a Fox card because people don't know Dos Anjos? And I think I would I don't think a lot of people know Alvarez as well. Um, Personally, what I would love to see would be Eddie Alvarez fight Rafael Dos Anjos. Um, I think that would be a great fight, but the Cerrone-Alvarez fight's got to go down first. And, um, you know, we keep going back and forth between all these divisions, which one's looking good, which one's bad, and all that. With Ben Henderson losing, that does amazing things for the lightweight division, doesn't it? Well, like I said, it, it like I said, if he wins, you know, that... You know, is a whole other situation with him already fighting Melendez, beating Melendez. He's lost to uh, Pettis twice. He's beaten Cerrone twice. You know what I mean? There, it, it created a lot of problems. You know, there, and you throw in Dos Anjos now in the mix. And like I said, the Cerrone fight has to happen now. Again, if Donald Cerrone wins, you could even create a situation where then Cerrone fights Dos Anjos again. 
because of the fact they're going to have to wait, and we know Cerrone loves to get right back in there. Oh, yeah. So there, there, there could be a scenario where Cerrone, especially if it is Cerrone, plays Joe Sanius again on the same card as Pettis and Melendez. That's a very real possibility. Absolutely. Um, uh, I mean, but if it, you know, if it's Alvarez, who knows? You know, I, I don't know. We'll we'll see. But it's uh, it's I definitely an uh, interesting situation. I bet Eddie Alvarez turns into Cerrone light if he can get through Cerrone pretty much unscathed. I would not be shocked if Eddie Alvarez turns it around, knowing that he's going to get paid big time. Um, I wouldn't be surprised considering how much he lost out on with the whole contract negotiation. But only time will tell. All right, well, let's get to our final round here on uh, Beyond the Cage, or final segment, UFC 177 picks. We will uh, break down the fights as well and preview them from Sacramento, California, this Saturday on pay-per-view. also want to send a quick shout-out to our friends at TopRatedMMA.com. You can uh, check out and buy their gear. It goes to the uh, Hire Heroes Foundation to hire uh, U.S. Army and uh, other armed service veterans. That's TopRatedMMA.com. Uh, as Dave's shown there, our friends at MMA Signatures USA.com. Check out all their uh, authentic signed MMA memorabilia. You can also follow uh, the CEO. We had him on, AJ Hiller, at AJ MMA Signatures. And again, the website's MMA Signatures USA.com. Yeah. Also, uh, our friends covering the regional scene uh, here in the Midwest at BluegrassMMA.com. You can give them a follow on Twitter at BluegrassMMA. Hey, did you see what they're doing at MMA Signatures now? I did. Um, if you, I'll, I'll bring it up cool real quickly, that? Dave. Comment. Yeah, they now when we had AJ on, he had mentioned that they were in talks to kind of become their own, you know, authenticating uh, entity, as it were. And here we are, what two, three weeks later, Dave, and they have already, uh, I guess, hired or spot. Okay. Yeah, I guess, I guess, hired would be the word. A person Acquired from the- JSA who is one of the major. Um, autograph certification companies to come in to help MMA Signatures uh, start this and become a full-fledged, uh, not only selling autographs, but able to authenticate your autographs as well to send them in and, and get them all uh, booked up. So what, you know, if you ever want to sell or trade any of that stuff, people know that is 100% uh, legit. Yeah, it's big, th- it's big time. So, uh, yeah, MMASignaturesUSA.com, check them out. And, uh, you know, if you're watching those shows and you see your favorite fighters got uh, that logo on them, send them a Facebook message and say, you know, say thanks for sponsoring, you know, those fighters. AJ does great stuff giving back to the uh, the MMA community. So definitely glad to be a part, have him be a part of the show. All right, let's get to the first fight here if you uh, UFC 177, and uh, that will be in the lightweight division, and that will be... Uh, Yancey Medeiros as he takes on Damon Jackson. And looking at Mr. Jackson, he will be making his uh, UFC debut. He is undefeated in his career. Of his uh, nine career victories, uh, seven are by submission. And uh, Dave, looking at his previous records, especially at Sheardog, he's actually fought the majority of his career at 145. So it looks as though he's moving up uh, for a chance to fight here in the UFC. He will be taking on Yancey Medeiros, who has fought three times in the UFC, 0-2 with a no contest. His last fight was a loss to Jim Miller at UFC 172, and of his nine career victories, six are by knockout. So just looking at the numbers I read off here, Dave, it looks as though Jackson probably wants to get this thing to the ground. If any of uh, our listeners have seen Yancey Madero's fight before, this guy is uh, very strong, he's very fast, and he's a very aggressive individual in the stand-up. And a guy that, if you saw that fight against Eve Edwards, you know he can put the hurt on you very quickly. And I think if you're Mr. Jackson, I think you want to try to get this fight to the ground. I think you saw in Madero's last fight that that's not his greatest area. So... If you're Damon Jackson, try to get this thing to the ground. You'll have a huge advantage, and you can probably get yourself another uh, submission victory and your first UFC victory kicking off a big uh, you know, pay-per-view event in Sacramento. So that, w- that would be a huge deal uh, for Mr. Jackson. Um, 
your assertion, or your assumption, I should say, about Damon Jackson wanting to uh, take the fight to the ground is probably spot on. With his nickname being the Leech and everything, um, he probably is very good at sticking to uh, his opponent once they get it to the ground. But, um, you know, did you say that he fought at 45 or at 55? Uh, he it, on Sheer Dog, it has him listed as a featherweight. So okay. it, I I don't know if his whole career has been at 145, but at least he has fought there. So like I said, it, it appears as though he's moving up a weight class. And I believe either his last fight or two fights ago, he fought Leonard Garcia, who of course we know does fight at 145. So uh, this will be you know obviously you know a little step up in weight, but you know I, I think the ground despite that he's taking on a guy that doesn't have a very good ground game. Yeah. Um, no, you know, um, I do remember him fighting Lennon Garcia. Um, no, this kid is good. Uh, like you said, I think he's going to take it to the ground. I think clearly, like he stated with all the numbers and everything, uh, his best chance is going to be on the ground. And, uh, yeah, let's see, let's see how the new weight class treats him and uh, should be all right. Hey, before we move to the next fight, I'm looking at Damon Jackson's profile on UFC.com. How weird is it that Felice Herrig is on the, uh, she's like on the little side ads. How crazy is that? Six months ago, you wouldn't have thought that. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. It says Game Changer, Felice Herrig, Alienware 14. Crazy. Nice. The anyway. n next fight of the evening will also be at 155 pounds as Carlos Diego Fajeda will take on Ramsey Nijem. Looking at Fajeda, he is 1-0 in the UFC. In his debut, he defeated former Ultimate Fighter winner Colton Smith at Fight Night 45, undefeated in his career at 10-0, and six of his 10 career victories are by submission. Looking at Ramsey Nijem, 5-3 in the UFC, currently riding a two-fight winning streak. His last fight was a victory over Benil Dariush at Fight Night 40, and four of his nine career victories are by decision. Now, if I remember correctly, Fajeda actually knocked out Colton Smith. So despite the uh, submission background there, he does have some power. Colton Smith's a pretty big 155-pound uh, individual, and he was able to dispatch him in the first round. So definitely surprising power, and I think that's something Nijem uh, has to look out for, who I think has improved stand-up Dave since his time on the Ultimate Fighter, but I think still raw in that category in a, you know, a little bit of a while at that time. So I think you know, Nijem's best plan of attack and usually what is his plan of attack is to be aggressive you know use his great cardio and pace to get this fight to the ground obviously maybe you're playing a little bit into Fajeda's hands you know with the submission game and stuff but I think because of that knockout of Colton Smith I think Nijem uh, you gotta be a little worried there because like I said I thought that was, that was a pretty big deal in his uh, UFC debut to do that so it's gonna be a very interesting fight and we'll see if Fajeda you know is up to the challenge taking on a very uh, tough competitor here in uh, Ramsey Nijem Jim I don't normally correct you, but I'm going to have to, just so people don't get the wrong impression. But uh, Colton Smith, he actually got submitted. He did not get knocked out. I think he may have oh, been... I, I'm a po I apo yeah, that's right. He got knocked down, though. Right. He was too set up the submission. I apologize. Yep. But I just, I just wanted to make sure we got all the right info for the fans. Um, no, um, Ramsey Nijum has been in high... has been in fights with high-level competition. Um his entire time in the UFC, he's got a few losses, um, but they're not bad losses. Miles Jury and uh, who was the other one? James Vick. But, I mean, he's looked good in most every fight that he's had, even in losses. Um, it's, it feels like it's been a while. It hasn't. It's only been like four months since Ramsey's been in there. feels like longer. But um, Ramsey's one of those guys that when he's in the cage, it always looks like he's having fun, like it's not a job for him. And it's an easy guy to root for. Um, you know, I, I think that... I think both of these guys are very well-rounded mixed martial artists. Um, I think that... Uh, Fahe Fahera, right? That's how you pronounce it? I'm, I'm going with Fajeda. That, uh, that's Because he has the same... It's the same spelling as uh, Cesar, the, you know, Mutanche. Mutanche. Yeah. How about so Diego? That, that's why I'm going with Fajeda. How about Diego? Whatever. <laughs> no, I mean, when I think both of these guys are um, complete mixed martial artists. 
uh, in Diego's last fight, like like we said, he was able to rock Colton Smith, who up until that point was a pretty sturdy guy, um, wasn't getting knocked down in fights, was usually the stronger guy. So you, both guys need to be alert wherever the fight is at. Um, I love I love this fight. Um, it's it's at a hundred and fifty five pounds. No. Yes. Yeah. It's at 155 pounds. Do I think either one of these guys is top 20 currently? No. Um, I think that this fight goes a long way in advancing the career of um, of one of these guys, and it's definitely a fight to tune into. The next fight of the evening will be in the women's bantamweight division as Betch Kohea will take on the Queen of Spades, Shayna Baszler. Looking at Kohea, she is 2-0 in the UFC. Her last fight was a victory over Jessamyn Duke at UFC 172, and of her eight career victories, seven are by decision. Looking at the Queen of Spades, Shayna Baszler, she will be making her UFC debut coming off the Ultimate Fighter. She's currently uh, lost two of her last three fights, uh, fighting for Invicta, and of her 15 career victories, 14 are by submission. Now, with that being said, Dave, it seems as though that's Baszler's best opportunity to try to make this thing a grappling fight. Despite being a shorter and kind of stockier 135-er, we saw in Kohea's last fight that she could take on who I, I believe is the tallest curl in the division, Jessamyn Duke, at like six foot two, and have no problem finding range, getting there, mixing up, and winning fights against taller fighters with a stand-up game. So, Baszler, who I don't think is as good as a striker as Jessamyn Duke, I think Betch Kohea would have no problem standing up and, you know, she's not known to get finishes, but maybe she could get it finished against uh, Shayna Baszler standing up. So I think if you're Shayna, you got to go in there, tie her up, and, and try to get her to the ground because uh, her stand-up, you know, while it maybe seem a little plotting and uh, maybe at times not flashy, it's it's active, it's fast, and it gets the job done. Yeah, I like Betch Kohea. I really do. Um, she she trains with the Pitbulls, right? That's why her nickname is Pitbull. Yes, she. I I don't think she's like their sister, but she's like their adopted kind of sister almost. Yeah. I like her. I like her because she goes right for the jugular. Um, she knows that. She knows who hangs out with Rhonda, and that you know, uh, Shane is one of the four horsewomen and all that kind of business. And she knows that if she knocks her out, it's going to get under the skin of Ronda Rousey. Is Betch Kohea ready for a title shot? I don't think so. But she's shown that she's got the ability to finish fights. Um, and getting under the skin of the champion is going to help you in the long run. Um, me, personally, I think that Betch Kohea is leaps and bounds uh, better than what we've seen of Shayna Baszler. Um, you know, she's the queen of spades, they call her. And... In her life, this will be um, her fourth fight since 2008. Loss, loss, loss. Um, and did she win a fight on the Ultimate Fighter, Jim? She won the fight to get in the house. And that's it, right? Yeah. Then she got submitted by Juliana Pena. And then, like I said, you know, just going back to her professional time, you know, she's lost two out of her last three fights and hasn't fought since uh, Invicta four. So it's just overall been a, a long layoff for her, too. you also got to add that in as a factor. Yeah, I'm just not sure why she's in this main card spot. Like she, Unless it's a fight that she's owed from the Ultimate Fighter or something like that. But um, there's got to be somebody else. I don't want to say better, but there's got to be somebody a little bit better suited for this than her coming off losses. I, let me say this, Jim. She lost to Sarah McMahon, Sarah Kaufman, and is that Cyborg, right? Christine Santos? Yeah, that's Cyborg, right? Yeah. It says Justino on UFC. Yeah, that I think I don't think she's no longer married to yeah. the, the original I mean, Cyborg Santos. <laughs> that competition is at is a pretty high level, but um I don't know. I'd like to see Shayna I would have liked to see her get a win before she gets thrusted onto the main card. But I don't make the fights, Jim. I just watch them. 
The co-main event of the evening is at 155 pounds as Danny Castillo will take on former Ultimate Fighter winner Tony Ferguson. Looking at Danny Castillo, 7-3 and three in the UFC. His last fight was victory over Charlie Brenneman at UFC 172. And believe it or not, despite being uh, known for his knockout power, actually 7 of his 17 career victories are by decision. Looking at Tony Ferguson, he is 5-1 and one in the UFC. He is currently riding a two-fight winning streak. His last fight was a victory over... Key Kuno at UFC 173, and of his 15 career victories, nine are by knockout. We have this fight, Dave. Uh, like I said, despite you know Castillo kind of being more known as a striker with that knockout power, I actually think Castillo should use some of that wrestling base that he has and uh, use some of the wrestling knowledge he's gathered from training with those guys in Sacramento at Team Alpha Male and try to get at Tony Ferguson this way, who I know is a long and lanky 155 or guy that can use leverage and stop the takedowns that way, but I, even though Castillo has knockout power, I think the range that Tony Ferguson presents, I think that's going to be a problem for Castillo getting on the inside, and uh, Ferguson's a very good striker, not just with his hands, but he also has a lot of kicks. I think a guy that has been steadily improving since his time on the Ultimate Fighter, and a guy that definitely has real knockout power, and Castillo's a guy, you know, he has been knocked out before he's been rocked, and, you know, sometimes uh, with those big looping shots that he throws, leaves himself open. And I think for Danny Castillo, I know you're, you know, fighting in front of somewhat your hometown there. You're all with the guys there in Alpha Male. You're in Sacramento. You want to put on a show. But I think you got to go in there and, and try to grind this one out because I don't think, you know, Tony Ferguson uh, is a guy that, you know, if you can't get on the inside, you're not going to have a lot of a striking success. And so he has to figure out early whether or not, that's something he thinks he can do. If not, he has to try to out wrestle Tony Ferguson because I I don't think I don't think he can stand with him for 15 minutes. I'll just put it that way. Yeah, Tony Ferguson is one of those guys. You know, he lost uh, back in 2012 to Michael Johnson, but this guy has done nothing but steadily improve. A lot like Michael Johnson, and I think he's one of those guys in the lightweight division that he's going to be a force at 155 pounds. He's only 30 but he's got 18 fights. I mean, he hasn't been doing it that long, and every time we see Tony Ferguson, he's a completely different fighter, or a completely more uh, refined, more refreshed. Uh, you know, it's always a, a better Tony Ferguson. And me personally, I think he's a little more well-rounded probably um, than Castillo. Uh, Castillo's going to have a lot of pressure, like you said, Jim, being with Team Alpha Male and having the fight so close to home, um, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on him. Is Castillo able to handle it? I'm not sure. Um, but this is just another fight for uh, Tony Ferguson, and I think I think Tony Ferguson's a more well-rounded guy. The main event of the evening for the UFC Bantamweight Championship as champion TJ Dillashaw puts his title on the line against the man he took it from in Hennon Burrell. Looking at Burrell, 7-1 in the UFC. His last fight when he lost his title to TJ Dillashaw at UFC 173 was his first loss in nine years. And of his 32 career victories, 14 are by submission. Looking at Dillashaw, 6-2 in the UFC. Again, beat Barrow in his last fight to become the champion at UFC 173. And of his 10 career victories, four are by knockout, including to win the UFC title in his last fight. Dave, I think this rematch was booked, uh, number one, because uh, Rafael Asuncion wasn't ready to go. Uh, number two, I think Barrow had been so dominant, he had been on such a winning streak that I think the UFC kind of felt like, all right, you know, maybe we kind of owe this guy uh, a rematch here. So they, they book him the rematch. Unfortunately, you know, this is not a stacked card. It, it kind of gets lost in the shuffle here of what are two very great individuals, uh, two of the best in their weight class. And looking at it the second time around, all the changes have to be done by Hen and Brow. To me, there's nothing TJ Dillashaw has to change. And... What will Henan Brow do to counter the pressure, the output, and the pace, and, and just also the power of TJ Dillashaw? What is he going to do to counter that? Because when we broke down the fight the first time, we said, Dillashaw, if he keeps up constant pressure, 
you can beat Burrell because he does not like guys getting in his face. And I don't know if in the, what, five months since the, the last time they fought Dave, I don't know if he has or if you can correct that in five months. I, I don't know if you can do it. And for Burrell, I like to say, oh, you know, just tie him up. But you're getting tied up with a guy who's a very strong individual, a guy who's known to be in the clinch with wrestling game. And, you know, if you get on your back, you I got a lot of submission victories. Maybe you catch him in something. Maybe. But do you really want TJ Dillashaw on top of you? I don't think you do. And to I guess to escape that pressure, obviously you got to look to counter. You got to maybe sometimes send your punches, and you got to use footwork and head movement. You know, you, you got to move out of those situations um, because Dillashaw is going to do exactly what he did. Like I said, he doesn't have to change anything. It's all on Hen and Brow. And if Hen and Brow can change a couple of those things, Dave, or you know, you know, maybe get lucky with one of those uh, punches or kicks, that I think that's maybe the only way he wins. It's it's crazy to think that the guy that looked unbeatable just two fights ago uh, now doesn't have a chance. <laughs> Yeah, um, a couple questions that you got to the, – the same stuff that happened when Anderson Silva finally lost, you know, does doubt creep into Hennon Burrell's head? Um, you know, he didn't get beat. He got dominated in his last fight. Um, and you can use whatever excuse you want for why it happened. It happened. Um, so is that seed of doubt there? I'm not sure. Um, I, it, to me, if you're TJ Dillashaw, even though you're you're the champ, I think you go at Henan Barrow in the first round and see if he wants to get into another fight. If you're TJ Dillashaw, you know that you have the cardio to go all five rounds. So test Henan Barrow um, and, and kind of see where he's at mentally. Um, it's kind of a home court advantage for TJ Dillashaw. The last fight was in Vegas, right? I believe so. Yeah, I think it was too. Um, so y y you got a couple things on your side if you're TJ Dillashaw. But the other stuff, you know me, Jim, I like to think of some of the outside of the box stuff. This is, t this is the first time TJ's the champion. He's the last one to walk to the cage. He gets the most questions at the press conference. You know, he gets the most autographs. He's got to call into all these different radio shows, podcasts video interviews, um, you know, it's got to do the Fox weigh-in show, all that stuff. Um, does that mess with him? Uh, you know, there's a lot of intangibles, but I think when it comes down to the fight, if it, it depends on what Hennon Burrell wants to do. I think it's as simple as that. Does he want to fight? Does he want his bell back? Or is there that seed of doubt that maybe he's not that good? Um, you know, that – yeah, it was impressive for nine years, but he wasn't fighting UFC caliber guys for nine years. With that said, Dave, let's get to some picks here for UFC 177. Starting first, 155, Damon Jackson against Yancey Medeiros. Even though it's his debut, Dave, I like the fact that Jansen has a good ground game against a guy that doesn't in Medeiros, so uh, I'm going to go with uh, Damon Jackson. Yep, I'm going to go with the leech, Damon Jackson. Also at lightweight, Carlos Diego Fajeda takes on Ramsey Nijem. I think Diego uh, has a lot of talent here, but I really like Ramsey Nijem. Like you said, uh, Dave, an uh, uh, easy guy to root for, uh, so give me uh, the man from Utah to win this one. I'll take the stripper, even though they, they can't say that. Can I, I take the stripper. <laughs> See what I did there? If you're not watching the video feed, this makes no sense to you. All right. Let's get to the next fight in the women's bantamweight division. Shayna Baszler against Betch Cohea. You know, Betch Cohea is really good. Um, I think she's going to beat another uh, one of the four horsewomen here, so give me uh, the pit bull sister, as it were, in Betch Cohea. Hey, Jim, can I make my pick like this? Oh snap! Look at that. Again, that, it doesn't make sense if you're not watch if you're not uh, if you're listening to the audio version. That just went down. <laughs> I pick. Uh, I'll take Betch, and I also pick Betch for the reason that I enjoy when the announcers say her name because you know that they're not trying to say 
something that's close to Betch. No, they're trying to say Bethe Correa. Yeah. <laughs> Not Betch Correa. All right, co made event of the evening, lightweight division, Danny Castillo against Tony Ferguson. I think we should see a good fight here for this co main event. Uh, Maybe even, well, they don't do fight of the night anymore, Dave, but I, I strike it to say we could see fight of the night between these two, but I'm going to go with the man uh, who spent some time here in Michigan, so I'm going to go with Tony Ferguson. Yep, I'm a big Tony Ferguson guy, um, and I'm going to pick him as well. Main event of the evening, Henna Brow, TJ Dillashaw for the second time and also for the Bantamweight Championship. Like I said, it's all on Henna Brow. What, what's he going to change in... As far as I know, I don't think Dillashaw has to change a thing, and I think it will be the uh, winning formula once again for him to successfully defend his title for the first time. So uh, give me Mr. Dillashaw. Yeah, um, I think uh, TJ Dillashaw is able to walk in, um, use his game plan to the best of his ability, and I think he walks out taking the cake. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Uh, we're getting punch drunk here at the late hour as it's uh, about 2 a.m. Eastern. But uh, thanks, everybody, who did watch live. If uh, you didn't, obviously, you're listening to an uh, on-demand uh, video version or uh, on the audio version. Uh, thanks for sticking with us. And, uh, again, sorry for the delay. Uh, you know, it's not every day my power goes out. So uh, thanks for sticking with us uh, on Beyond the Cage. Again, like our Facebook page, facebook.com slash podcast YouTube channel, which... Probably already watching, but subscribe to it anyway. YouTube.com slash Beyond the Cage Podcast. Dave is on Twitter at Vigilante Juice, and I'm on Twitter just at uh, Jim Graham. Any final thoughts here, Dave? Hey, stay tuned to both of our Twitters and Facebook. Um, we will have a uh, contest with our friends from ANN Sports Cards uh, in regards to um, champions when it comes out, and you can also stay tuned because we are going to have the brand manager from Tops, um, Jeremy Fullerton, is going to come on right before Champions releases and talk about uh, everything UFC cards that you could possibly imagine. All right, for Dave Sadler, I am Jim Graham. Thank you for listening to a, another edition of the Beyond the Cage podcast presented by Fight Chicks.